welcome to Artificiality, brought to you by the founders of Saunders Studio. Artificiality is a podcast dedicated to understanding the emerging community that is humans and machines. We take the latest in the human side, decision science, psychology, and design, and put it together with advances in artificial intelligence and big data so that you can understand how to work better with machines and your fellow humans. We founded Saunders Studio to help people be more human in the age of AI. We're on this learning journey too, so we strive to find the frontiers, to ask the best questions, and stay curious. We interview some of the top minds working at the intersection of humans and machines, and make sure we have a few laughs along the way. All major companies are working to increase the value of data science. Setting a goal may be easy, but implementation often raises challenging questions. How should companies think about the role of data scientists? the challenge of increasing diversity in data science, and increasing data literacy in data-driven decision-making. In this episode, we talk with Megan Brown, the Director of Data Science for Starbucks Global Center of Excellence. Megan has a unique background. They have experience and expertise in both humans, with a PhD in experimental psychology, and in machines and data as a practicing data scientist. This gives them a unique perspective on how to help others solve business problems with data. We talk with Megan about their journey from fifth grade teacher to data scientist, how non-data science executives should make the most of data science, the responsibility of humans to act on predictions from models and make human-to-human connection, the challenge of asking data scientists to take on too many roles, the conundrum of self-service, and their Aspen Institute-sponsored project to bring more diversity to data science by bringing Starbucks partners from the stores into data science roles. Megan, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, how did your career start and what was your journey to where you are now? Sure. Well, the first job I had out of college was actually teaching fifth grade. Uh, I signed up with Teach for America. I was placed just outside of Phoenix, Arizona, and I taught everything, everything to fifth graders. Uh, What I learned about myself was I could uh, write a math curriculum pretty well. That was a little bit of a surprise for me. Uh, But none of the best practices for reading comprehension actually worked Uh, because I had a very diverse language, diverse and racially and ethnically diverse classroom, as you do. Uh, outside of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, And so I decided to go to grad school to study reading comprehension in diverse populations. Uh, Unfortunately, I signed up for cognitive experimental psychology. And the punchline about reading comprehension from cognitive experimental psychology is it's based in experience. So to some extent, we study the creation of associations between concepts, but actually the concepts are built from experience. So we don't actually study it with more depth than that. So I had a hard pivot in the middle of grad school where I switched to a lab that uh, did an early form of deep learning. They were toy models, toy neural network models to kind of mimic how humans learn to read. Uh, And then what became natural language processing, it was known as corpus analysis, And then experiments, of course, because, you know, you're in psychology, you have to do some experiments. Um, I graduated, hung out as an academic for a little bit, and uh, like 2008 had happened, and it ate all the jobs in academia. So a lot of my friends had migrated to data science and industry, and I didn't really believe it would work for me, even though I had this minor in econometrics and education. And all of the psych stats I could possibly stomach to take. Uh, So eventually I made the jump and it all panned out. And since then I've done data science on employees. I've done data science on consumers. uh, And now I mostly help people understand data science to some extent and advocate for its use. That's quite a journey. (laughs) Do you you find the... um... Your original interest in reading comprehension to be useful? I mean, teaching a machine to read, teaching a person how to read at, to understand. I'm just curious about that comprehension connection. I know. Well, it does help inform, like it helps inform how I think about models. 
Yeah. Right. Because originally they were designed to mimic how humans learn. And then we basically overpowered them. And they can learn different things than humans because they don't have all the context we do. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they don't have arms and hands and eyes. So they really only know what we show them. Um, so to that extent, the models are really explainable for me. Right. You can take this really complicated ensemble, deep learning model and you can say, well, it's it's this which does that on top of this it outputs something to another model, which cleans up the output and spits it out. Right. Uh, because I understood I understand the original use. The way you describe that, it's like, like you have been able to put this expertise and experience of both humans and machines together gives you a, a, a unique mental model for how to think about mm -hmm. explaining data science and how to yeah. think about explaining AI. And so how do you, how do you make that practical when you help other people solve business problems with data science? I mean, I take it down a few notches, right? Like there's a lot of hype around AI ML, uh, most of the time when someone's telling you they're doing AI, they're not, right? Normally it's ML, probably a logistic regression, maybe a random forest. Those are not the most complicated things ever. <laughs> and so you just, you take it a few steps back, knowing that everyone wants to get to AI and only a few places really, really do. Um, once you bring it back to like logistic regression or a linear model or a decision tree, that's actually pretty easy to describe. And more complicated models add more complicated layers into that. But, you know, you can say, well, this sops up variance a different way. Or this parses out noise by doing these things. Or the hidden layers of this model uh, focus on different things and learn different kinds of information. And that information informs other hidden layers that learn other kinds of information. So... You know, you start from the really, really straightforward wing of ML, and you can expand from there. But mostly people are just happy to know that there's, a, like, a mechanism, and it's not magic. Mm, yeah. And and you're able to kind of break it down into things that people have already had experience in, like statistics. Yeah. So when we we like to think of da data as, as what we've chosen to pay attention to, something that mm -hmm. you can measure and pay attention, pay attention to and measure. But that's pretty broad. So, you know, how do you define data and, and how much variability do you see in how others think about data? Um, so I think about data like we all live in this world, this multidimensional world with light and colors and sound and people and uh, animals and, and, and just everything. Only some of that can be measured. Right. So I don't even know. I, I guess I could take a guess at what percentage actually could become data of our daily experience. It's probably quite low. Right. I, I'll, I'll say I'll say 20 percent because we use our phones a lot. Right. Um, the part of the world that can become data is all we have to model off of. Right. The rest of the world just isn't available to to the machines. I think people get much more specific when they think about data. They think about the pivot tables and the Excel spreadsheets and uh, that. And I, I think often we have to break that for people because they're, they're, they're a little bit passive about like the data just come to you, but we make data all the time. So if we don't have the data we need, we can actually go get it or go make it or find a new way to measure uh, and get what we need. Why do you think it's so hard for most people to use data? I mean, there's too much of it, <laughs> right? So this is where the, the machines win, right? We can think about two, three dimensions comfortably. Uh, we can model infinite dimensions. Like if you have enough computing power, you can model as many dimensions as you want. You'll never understand it. Um, but we have two or three. And so if you end up with a data set with 12 variables, you have to pit the variables against each other again and again and again to figure out like where is there actually a pattern, A, and where is the pattern actually important? And that's kind of tedious, 
right? Like it's a full factorial, like all of those things have to be against all the other things at a different point in time. And then you need to make sense of that. So even summarizing 12 variables is kind of complicated. You you say something that's really interesting that it's um, not just modeling, but understanding which dimensions are important. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you think about, as someone who's focused on data literacy, how do you help people figure out what's important when they can't think beyond those three dimensions and Mm -hmm. our brains didn't evolve to actually handle this. We can't, we can't see the complexities of the data space. How do you help people understand when it's important and when it's not important? I think you have to get them manipulating their data, right? It's, it doesn't feel like it's hands-on because it's in a computer, but I actually really do think about it, it like building sandcastles. You need to get your fingers in the sand to see how it feels, to see how it flows, to see where it falls over uh, in order to understand the sand, right? The same thing's true with data. And maybe it moves faster than sand. It's bigger than sand. It's more like a waterfall just rushing at you all the time. But you have to take a piece of that waterfall. You have to put your fingers in the water to figure out, is it cold? Is it warm? How fast is it moving? Is it a trickle right now? Um, And that's, I think, the part that's not quite there yet for everyone. Do you think that's like building an intuition for the data? You do eventually build an intuition from playing with it, right? I've actually had, I have conversations with a friend who just moved to a new role and she's a data scientist, but she's, she's actually an epidemiologist by training. And she remembers in grad school, like a professor would look at the data she was presenting and be like, hmm, something's not right right there. And she'd be like, no, no, I did it all. It's all clean. It's right. And then she went back and he, he was absolutely correct. And that's the kind of knowledge about data we expect to happen really easily, but that's years and years of experience. So yeah, you can get to your intuition about data, but you have to start now and you have to keep touching the data. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm I'm thinking you know, in, peri- in past periods of my life, you spent spent a lot of time modeling, a lot of financial modeling, and mm-hmm. that was easier, right? Because it's literally rows and columns, and it's in Excel, and the and the math is really quite simple, you know, arithmetic. But you can de- definitely develop quite a an intuition for the data. You can look at a model, and you can know what the metrics are that are driving it, and then have a sense of when something's not right, and going hunting through and just finding well, there's a calculation error in there, but that's something which that's within the mental grasp, right? Mm-hmm. It's easy. You know, yeah. if you were fast enough, you could do the whole, you know, math in your head. Um, but that's quite different in, t- in the sort of hyperspace of, of data that you're frequently working in. Um, that makes it, that's, it's much harder to think about developing an intuition about something that you can't even, you can't even comprehend. You can't see, you know? Yeah. I, I get a lot of mileage out of connecting the data to the source it came from. Right. So, yeah, you can have 400 variables in a data set, but what do they actually represent? Right. So when 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 I'm running analytics in a retail organization and we have stores and we have partner partners or employees, we have customers, we have uh, the space around a store. All of those things give us plenty of data. Some of the data are important and meaningful and will cause or be associated with something else changing. Um, but you have to go back to the source of the data and go back to the goal or the question. The question really helps you decide what's important. Different questions mean different variables are important. Uh, and you need to use your, your real world experience in a store with an employee or another customer. Uh, you have to remember walking up to that store and knowing what's around that environment typically. And then you start to be able to really make sense of it. But the machine data is is much harder to do that with, right? Like if you have a data set of a thousand variables created by 20 different machines, you're not going to be able to get quite to that point. But most of our data come from people in the world doing things. There's a fascinating thought that one of the things about going back to the machine data is not not just that it's big and not just that it's abstract. It's actually that you don't have any intuition over over cause and effect. 
You actually right. don't have a sense of even if it's even if it's completely wrong because you you your causal yeah. thinking is is flawed in any particular circumstance. There's a comfort with knowing that you with this expectation that you'll find a cause. And sometimes there are just no causes, right? It, at some point sometimes your theory about the causalness is more like a conspiracy theory than anything else. The way business analytics typically sort out, it's not causal, right? The the scale of model that you'd have to build to uh, inspire an assumption of causality is quite large. And we typically don't build models that large within analytics. Uh, and you know, getting there through experimentation is another pathway, but experiments are slow and costly. Uh, and when the decision's moving very fast, you, you often don't do experiments. So I think probably my answer is the assumption of causality is always there. Uh, when I'm building those kinds of analyses, I try to be as mindful as possible about what else was happening at that same time, right? Like if you launch a product at the same time as a pandemic ha- kicks in and your product doesn't do well, it wasn't the product. You don't know if that product would have done well. It was the pandemic. And so you you always have to bring additional context in, even when it, it's not really data you can build into the analysis. And the other challenging thing about that is frequently the analysts and data scientists building those analyses don't have that context like it's not always a pandemic. Sometimes it's a launch or an offer that went out at the same time. Uh, but the business folks do. And that's why the conversation is really important. Do you think that this insight and the way that we use analytics in, in a modern business environment says anything different about the path of your career? It just seems amazing if you could be incredibly experienced and incredibly data-driven, right? You've got both of those mm-hmm. skills going for you. Do they have to move in lockstep, I guess, is my question. I don't think they have to move in lockstep. I think the way that, that I consider it is when I left academia to come to industry, I was very excited about the models, like the fanciest models. I'd find a way to use them, like just be like, oh, this is a perfect problem for a structural equation. Model. And part of that first learning was actually that's not, not what people need from your analysis. They actually need something really, really simple. And you you pull out those tools when people have the pressing questions where the correlations are not visible in the noise, uh, where you have a lot of information that you can use in the problem. But the vast majority of the, the time, it's a much smaller problem set, right? So that was the first uh, real learning coming out of academia. Uh, the second thing that I really... Uh, had to remember, because academia didn't value necessarily my teaching skills. I had to revisit my teaching skills and the communication of complex information in small snips. Because people are busy. They're not data experts. They're not analytics experts. Uh, I remember being so surprised at how little information executives had to make a decision off of. Uh, So what you put in those three bullet points really, really matters. Uh, and I think the storytelling necessary for someone who's data savvy or analytics savvy, and then the data literacy of those leaders make it, when both of those are high, make it very easy for them to communicate across. Because if you only get three bullets, you might as well have a five minute conversation, come to clarity. Uh, and then the executive makes the decision and the analyst goes back and asks more questions of the data. And I think it's a really interesting conundrum for data scientists about whether to develop their technical skills more, right, to to make your code more efficient or to learn a new type of model or to learn a new language as things change every two years, or to invest in how you communicate your work with others. And I, I don't have a really satisfying answer because I've been investing in communicating my work in the last two years. But before that, I would have invested in the tech. Hmm. We had a previous um, guest on the on the podcast a year or so back, Jevin West hmm. from UW, um, computer science prof, and, and he was very much in the, in the latter case 
uh, for advising a lot of his students to to mm -hmm. think hard about that question, and the if they wanted to work in industry, helping people actually understand how to use data in a in the real world, that was that was the the one to go for. If you were to think about the executives, right? So you're you're in a process of bringing you know analysis, as you say, to executives who then have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. They're not data experts. They're not you know analytics experts. They don't have the intuition to yeah. look at this to, to look at this analysis and try and have some sense of where it is. If you think about it, is there some way that you could identify what the minimum viable data literacy should be, like an MVDL? Like, how would you define this? Say, like to be like a successful VP of marketing or sales or some function in the business that's yeah. not analytics. What what do they need to get to in terms of a minimum viable understanding in order to be able to be able to make a decision and not just sort of blindly say, "I trust you. You're really smart." I guess we'll, you know, do what it says. I think there's something about uh, asking for cited sources, right? Is this the right data set? What dashboard did you use? Is it the canonical dashboard? Is it a derivative one that like our intern stood up years ago and like hasn't been maintained since? Uh, so really asking where the data are coming from, um, creating a culture within your org with a solid set of definitions. So when your people come to you, they know exactly what you mean. And hopefully that's written down somewhere that's searchable. Right. Right. So if you're saying, I want to know how many trans average transactions happened in this region over this time period, the definition shouldn't be up in the air. Right. Hopefully it's built into a dashboard Hopefully it's solid, searchable, and if people have questions, they can go find it and find us me, right? So those two things are really, really important. Um, I also think there's something around asking for descriptives, right? So knowing what the shape of your transactions looks like, right? What's normal? What's in a store? Like what are the different patterns of transactions that can happen in a store over the course of a day? What does that look like in aggregate? What does that look like in a quarter? Um, asking questions that get a little closer to the data so you feel a little more confident that that estimate is within range or that this calculation is defined the correct way and pulled from the correct source. So, And then beyond that, there is, there is that moment of combination with experience and intuition, right? Because the data don't, always have the right answer. You can't always answer the question with the data and be correct. Uh, and that is probably something that comes with experience, knowing when to lean on experience and intuition and when to lean on the data. And it's really nice when they all align. Like those, those feel great, those, those moments. Um, the intuition with the data, because we talked about it just before, I think about that like a a, a neural network with a few hidden layers, <laughs> right? Like the, your first, your first interactions with the data are just very confusing and you're looking for signal. Um, your second, you know, second tier of interactions after that first hidden layer sort of sorts itself out and you're like, okay, I can see a graph. I can calmly interpret the graph. Great. The second layer is really around like, where did this come from? Is this accurate? Who did this? Who's this me? All of that. The third layer starts to be like, it's from experience. The, the, the hidden layer just before this is all about aggregated experience. It's the average of your experience over time. So as your experience gets better, your average gets better, but it takes a very long time to drag that average up upward, right? So the executive who could look at a graph of the data that they've seen every week for the last five years and say, that's off. Do you have a new person working on this? Like that's, that's where you'd want them to get eventually. Yeah. So they could develop a, an intuition at the, at the presentation level, mm -hmm. if you will. Right. Yeah. But that only comes over a period of time. That's right. And they have to look at those graphs, right? They have to have the time to revisit the data routinely, uh, to feel confident with uh, their interpretation of the data. 
and then eventually they get there. But if you don't have routine access or the graph looks different every time, it's kind of a problem. Yes, because that familiarity is required to, um, to to sort of keep reinforcing mm-hmm. the what it is that they're looking for. What what if what do you find? How do you handle when people j- just get frustrated because there's no clear answer in the data? How do you help them <laughs> through that journey? <laughs> um, I really I enjoy that journey a little bit. Uh, I'm a little bit of a um, perhaps a risk taker in those scenarios. So when you hit that point where there's nothing coming out of the data that would suggest there's a pattern and you've gotten the other person to the point where they, they agree with you and they're lost. That's when you take out like a really good uh, question storm or brainstorm. That's when you talk about, well, how could we get closer? And that, relies more on my psychology experience because then you're actually designing a study, right? So if it's not coming out of the data on its own, maybe there's no signal and you can design a quick study to figure out if the signal is actually there in the real world, but not in the data. Um, And those are the kinds of solutions I propose in that circumstance. And, you know, those studies only really come to fruition if the problem is really important but it does help to kind of break into the thing uh, and start asking questions about the assumptions and start talking about whether those data to test those assumptions exist or not currently, whether we would go make them or whether they just will never exist. How have you found um, using data to help guide people to actually ask the right questions. I mean, there's so many times that you, you kind of get presented with a fait accompli when you're, when you're further down an organization, here's the answer, go do. But if you have a, um, there's also just as many times that people that are closer to the, the coalface as it were, um, are, or the front lines have, a, have a different perspective of mm-hmm. what the problem is. And the, and because there's that power imbalance, you can't always necessarily push up that view. It's like, but yeah. with with data to hand and the, the front lines in some ways has more data, how can we, mm-hmm. how can you help people sort of push up better questions or a different view uh, of that question to more senior people? There's a couple of things embedded in this. So one is, uh, When executives go to the front lines, they have a very unique curated experience, right? Perhaps the district manager has chosen the perkiest of employees to meet that executive and talk about their role, right? So in some ways, often the data counteracts uh, lived experience, and that's really hard for people to wrangle. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that I think Starbucks does really well is they have market research situated right next to data science. There's always opportunities to do more of this, but market research is the survey voice coming from the front lines, coming from our customers, coming from uh, anyone who will respond to a survey for us at any point in time. Uh, And then looking for uh, sort of corroboration in the data for trends you're seeing. And that can go both ways, right? You can be inspired by patterns you're seeing, shifts you're seeing in the data, and then go ask some real questions of people. And then um, you can find changing trends and the responses coming back from people over time and go find it in the data. Uh, And that's, I mean, that's mixed methods research coming right out of academia. The fact that you should like both look for those deep patterns and uh, see if you can find uh, evidence for those patterns in people's lived experiences. And I always think, I mean, in my dream world, we would be in stores basically all the time, right? Anytime we launch something new, we'd be like, how's this going? And you have people doing that informally at Starbucks, but uh, in my dream world, it would be more formal. I'm curious, speaking of the sort of uh, Starbucks, but then also previously at Amazon, right? You've, mm-hmm. you've had experience in one of the most sophisticated automated organizations, you know, there is. 
in terms yeah. of the customer interaction, supply chain, everything else. And then now in an organization that prizes that human connection. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about that transition of having at least a similar expertise, even if the role might be somewhat different, but the expertise you're bringing around data and data science, where there's this vision in the overall world of more automation, yeah, right? And how that journey has been going from a place that is, you know, that has this ultimate focus, or at least from the outside, it feels like an ultimate focus on automation to an ultimate focus on connection. So for context, I was within, I worked in HR at Amazon uh, and ostensibly I was built in to build attrition risk models for software developers. The thing about attrition risk models is at some point someone needs to take action right? Like the, the model can predict with some accuracy, humans are wily, they have free will, you can't be perfectly accurate. Uh, but with some accuracy, that people are likely to leave in the next X months. Um, professional po populations tend to move more slowly. So it's probably six to 12 months, honestly. But then someone has to be able to take action on that. So just having an accurate model, uh, which I think is what they wanted, uh, does not mean doesn't mean you're going to save those people because the saving happens through connection. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's really ultimately the punchline of all of the predictive models I've, I've made in the employee and uh, retail spaces and call center spaces is like, we want to predict attrition. We can use that in forecasting. Sure. We could be super cynical and be like, ah, they're just going to leave whatever. It's fine. But actually what, what you need to do is bring reasons to the leaders of those teams and have them intervene reasonably and positively based on those reasons. Uh, and that's generally through like a really friendly dashboard, um, something that's easy to glance at and look at. Oh, so-and-so's red. Why are they red? Oh, it looks like they burned through all their PTO. I wonder what's going on. You know, so and then that manager going to talk to that person. So you can have a super, super predictive model. Uh, you could be super creepy with the data you include in that predictive model within like legal constraints. Uh, but until you decide to put it in a position where speaking to a human, nothing's going to change. So even at Amazon and perhaps, you know, that implies some reason as to why I left, like, your your people still have to be willing to interpret the data, take action on the data. And uh, sometimes that means like they have to identify a flaw in their leadership and, you know, move forward. At least at Starbucks with the connection, as long as you make that dashboard very, very user friendly, uh, once people interact with it and use it to be a better leader, they'll use it again. So really at Starbucks, the threshold is not the accuracy of the model. It is uh, getting that dashboard to a point where it's just easy. Yeah, you're talking about the system overall, not just not just the model. That's, That's right. the way the, the people interface. How, how do you see some of the um, the, the complexities with, with what people want to use when the data mm -hmm. is so complex, you know, at the, this whole level of, storytelling and communication? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think one of the reasons that uh, data scientists and perhaps engineers really struggle with the storytelling is by the time it becomes a story, it's so far away from the minutia of decisions that you've made to build that whole thing that took you months of your life that it feels really unsatisfying. It almost feels like you're lying uh, because that dashboard has like, five columns that turn red when one of them is flagging and a list of names. And that hides the really complicated data prep that I had to do, the feature production and selection that I had to do. It hides the four different models I tested on those data. It hides how I had to clean up the output to make it more understandable by humans who don't necessarily love data like I do. And then the story you get is like, we can be proactive with attrition. Look, your managers can go look at this dashboard. They can identify their people, figure out like an indication of what might not be working for that person and go talk to them. 
that's months of work <laughs> right there in those four sentences. Uh, it can, it, it, it sometimes feels like you have to counteract all of your technical knowledge to get that level of story, which is actually really compelling for other people. There's so much of what we're talking about here where there's a, a real need for a diverse background and diverse um, mm. experience and skill set, right? So yeah. data scientists, in order, to, in order to be successful, need to be able to figure out how to communicate and tell stories. They need to understand humans and human behavior, not just in the, the human in the data, but also the humans that are communicating the data too. That's right. And those non-data scientists have to understand enough about data to be able to query it and ask some questions and sort of say, well, you sure did you, where did this come from? And, you know, all of those kinds of things. And it's, I think one of the sort of true conundrums of leading an organization today is figuring out how to combine those two skill sets. Yeah. You see some organizations divide them into different roles. And sometimes that means there's a conflict between them because if you have someone talking about your models to the business uh, who didn't build them, they might be getting credit for other people's work. And sometimes, not to stereotype data scientists, but sometimes we're not the most humble people. <laughs> so we might not understand our own limitations uh, in terms of communication. So that can create a, a lot of conflict. I think Starbucks tries to look for that those skill sets in in the same person. It's really easy to measure a technical skill set, though right? Like I can generate a tech screen for you for SQL right now. Um, it's really hard to measure the communication skill sets. And I think I've seen a few places struggle with what are their expectations of communication skill and how would you know that those expectations are met, right? Is it executive presence? Is it storytelling? Is it just a general lack of fear of standing up in front of people and talking about models? Is it making models really approachable uh, generically, right? Is it delivering a great result and then maybe not having any other business context? There's a lot of different ways to try to cross over. And I, I think, you know, probably the answer is that we need all of them, but we don't know how to you know, necessarily measure and assess all of them. And they're built through experience. And it's scary to get that experience. Right. If you're a data scientist, you, tr you, you learned your models, you learned your data prep, you learned your coding, you've, you've honed up on those skills and perhaps standing in front of like 20 people, some of whom are VPs is, you know, makes you shake a little bit. And, and you have to understand the people in the data. You have to mm -hmm. understand culture and how things change in the real world with people in a social setting yeah. that is not what you learned. You know, um, and it's it's interesting to watch some of the Twitter chatter among the data science, you know, Luminati. Uh, and there are definitely some who basically pretty clearly are out there saying that, you know, they don't really care about people. Yeah. Um, you know, and that that's pretty hard, um, I think, on the overall community, because the truly great data scientists, I th you know, I, I think have to truly understand the people in their data in order to know how to really think about it, how to know when there's a gap that, that they didn't understand when the world changes so quickly. We've now gone from a world, you know, the world dramatically changed two years ago. Now we're yep. all at home. Our data is completely different. Um, yep. Our the cultural changes in the, in a broad, you know, across the society mean that the definitions that we used to use for people are not necessarily all still valid. So mm -hmm. how do you think about that? And are you sensitive to those changes to be able to catch them? Since right. the people you might think are more people people in your organization aren't skilled enough to get into the data. I almost wish what we could do when we hired someone to say, are you a data only person? Is that where you want to be? And then have a career path for a data only person where you pair them up with someone who has the concepts of the things they're building, but needs to take it outward, right? So sort of a product manager, UX designer, and a builder paradigm. Are you a hybrid person, right? So are you going to try and do both? Because there's certain settings where that will play really well in to a limit. Or are you a storyteller? Are you going to err on the side of storytelling if we, 
if you put you in this situation. Um, Because those are very different career trajectories. But right now we have them all in the same job title. As long as they have any technical skill, they can be an analyst or a data scientist or a decision scientist. But I almost wish we could just ask people once a year, what do you want to do this year? That's a fascinating way to think of it. If you think about the sort of history of engineering, software engineering teams, which are not totally dissimilar. Yeah. You, know, you know, I worked with, I grew up in the world of product marketing. So I was the, the I was the bridge, right? To understand yeah. the technology well enough to, to communicate with the customers, to figure out the messaging, bring that back to the team. We had engineers who were off the charts, incredible, um, who would never step foot outside of the engineering team meeting. That's right. And they were so valuable, um, but that was clearly where they were. And then yep. there are other engineers who wanted to become management and manage That's teams. Right. Or grow, right? And then you had people who were sort of ancillary, they, all the UX and UI designers to figure out exactly how, that, you know, how it should be presented and shared with the world and what the design is. There's all, you're right that it is fascinating that at least currently kind of in your world, they're all, those roles are all kind of munged up. They haven't, yeah. they haven't been pulled apart in the same way to allow people to specialize in what they want to be not be forced into being able to be, you know, sort of a Jack Jill of all trades. That's right. Uh, taking that really brilliant engineer or that really brilliant data scientist who doesn't really want to get up in front of people and then punishing for them not wanting to get up in front of people. Like that's probably not what we should be doing, right? They're already driving value for the company as they are. And then on the other side, the way I think about the movement to storytelling um, is really like, all right, so you want to lead people. Cool. You need to be able to summarize your work at a higher level than you do currently. Let's move you into these experiences in this middle camp. And that will help you work with your team, right? Because management is a completely different skill set. Um, you'll still be kind of like a player coach in that world, but you probably won't get as deep into the code as you used to. And then some people are fearless. I mean, I'm relatively fearless up in front of people. So I can tell a good story. I'm not going to be scared if they push back. You know, you defend a dissertation. You're like, oh, the snake fight's over. I'm good. Um, (laughs) So, you know, uh, those folks, that's probably even still a different career path, right? Is that your, your pitch person in your org? Does that person have, is that person your, your face for executives on highly technical things? Like, what is that? We don't have that role. Like, we have people who can do that and can turn it on when necessary, but we don't have that specific role for those people. What's the role of technology in taking away some of this tension, whether mm-hmm. it be like some sort of way for uh, for, for people to have the data meet them where the, where they are, if you like, um, yeah. so that there there is less need for translation and people can be more sort of naturally um, in their in their lane, if you like. Their, that um, and they can reach other people th- through that. You know, who who's yeah. the expert on this data? Could be one one question, whereas another question could be just someone putting in their own, you know, their own SQL query, and someone else would say, you know. Where's Alexa? Tell me what's in this chart. <laughs> There's sort of that whole entire spectrum of um, what. How do you think about developing the the technology that can help in this? Put the humans and the machines together, if you like. I think it's it's the conundrum of self service, right? Like you, if you don't have that that self-service, that like search, that um, find this me kind of system, your analytics teams are fielding questions that could be self-service, but aren't. And sometimes your analytics teams are fielding questions that could be self-service and are, but they don't know where it is. So you do it anyway, because it's just faster. Uh, But what that means is your analytics teams are pulled kind of down the sort of order of operations towards pivot tables and might not be the best use of their time. So in order to actually like drive more value with your analytics and data science talent, you need that self-service in place 
And I've worked in many organizations, not to imply that any of them that have been mentioned on this call have struggled in this area at all. Uh, but there is always this tension in an analytics organization around like standing up reporting versus the hard hitting work. And like some organizations do, we're going to stand up reporting first and then we'll get to the good stuff. They never get to the good stuff. We're going to do half and half. Uh, but unless you have really great boundaries, you, you don't. Uh, so when it comes to self-service and like the struggle with self-service and how it really hasn't landed most places, I think where I, where I currently think the problem is, is humans have information about data that they're not sharing. So it cannot be linked to the data in our systems. And because that information is absent, like it's the data in our systems are not as useful as they could be. And they're not as, uh, I won't maybe intuitive is not the right word, but transparent. Uh, so really when you're thinking about like searching the data, you're not actually thinking about searching the data. You're thinking about searching for those three metrics your leader cares about. Uh, but you need a definition for those metrics in the system and then you need the right names for it, knowing it gets called four different things at your company. And then you need to know the people attached to those, knowing that people change, right? We change roles all the time. Their reorgs happen all willy nilly. Uh, so there's a lot of changing information, a lot of maintenance of the human side of the information that would need to happen. And I don't know that we quite have that muscle. And I've been trying to practice that muscle. So I think we can get closer and closer. Uh, but even, even in the work that I've done, which is analytics people, adding their definitions, adding their SMEs, adding their code, adding their whatever to the data, the system data, we're still missing the business side of that. And I don't think we've ever made the pitch to the business about the value of their knowledge in feeding it into the system, into our knowledge, into the system knowledge, that that will give them something much more helpful back. Uh, so I think that's probably the current flaw in, in what I've been pushing. It sounds like there's um, when searching for the data, there's uh, as much value, more value, something in that value is what you're actually doing is searching the knowledge of the other humans. That's right. That's where the, that's really where it's coming from is to find out where other humans have put their knowledge into code of some sort. Uh, and yeah. can you find it? Can you figure and if out that was, where it is? If that was high, if that, when that is highly valued, then more of it will go in, and then you yeah. start that virtuous circle. Do you have to yeah. actually value people um, somehow, uh, you know, putting that, that knowledge in? And it has to be done in an easy way. Mm -hmm. And sharing is the easiest way because then the machine can read what got shared rather than a human having to actually type in, like, absolutely everything. That's right. You have to, I, I'm a firm believer in you have to meet people where they are. Uh, I think part of the trouble with that is we're in 40 different places at once. Mm. And not all of those places have, you know, the, the high standard APIs that they should have. And it's because no one's ever asked for it or demanded it, I guess, uh, as their, as their client. But yeah, if we could meet people in the 40 different places, where their, their knowledge lives and pull from their knowledge and, you know, have probably some great deep learning ensemble model of all of the stuff happening at the company and then get meaningful output outputs from that about, you know, the, what the graph actually is. Uh, that would be delightful. But that first part, it's hard. Mm -hmm. I have sort of uh, I have three sort of short questions to finish with. All right. Um, one is, uh, what, are the, what do you think the three things are that everyone should know about data science? I'm a rabble rouser. Uh, so I'm going to say it's not as complicated as you think it is. And if you know linear models, you know some data science. Hmm. So those are two things. And the third thing is, it's really neat and everyone can learn to do it. It's not something anyone's born with. We all pretend it makes us very, very special. But actually, like, SQL is really easy to learn. And Python is an 
like an easier language to learn. So don't let the hype scare you from the field. Awesome. Second question. What do you think the three things are that everything, everyone should know about how humans make decisions? Ah. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, free will, like, and free will, like, you know, writ large, uh, makes human decisions inconsistent. You can have all of the characteristics of making a no on this choice and still make a yes. Right? Like, we're wily. We do whatever we want. And the closer you get to actual human behavior, the harder it is to predict anything. And we think we think that's not true. <laughs> that's the real killer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, final question. You started your career as a fifth grade teacher, and now you're an expert in artificial intelligence. So I have to ask the obvious question is, when will AI be smarter than a fifth grader? When it has all of the same information a fifth grader has. <laughs> or maybe, maybe I'll put a threshold a little lower, 85% of the information a fifth grader has. I do have one bonus question for you, sure. actually. Yeah. I'm quite curious about the inclusivity challenges in data science mm -hmm. and as the impact of breaking the gender binary is mm -hmm. on data science as a field, accuracy of historical models. It seems like the gender binary is kind of one of those core things that shows up in everybody's data set about people. Yep. What, what is your perspective on that? I'll start somewhere pretty complicated, which is like, uh, gender is just the beginning, mm. right? Like if you're thinking about bias in your models, gender is really kind of easy to get out of people. We don't think it's totally personal information. It wouldn't, will probably never be PII. So like, that's just the start. Once you, once you hash out gender, then you need to start layering in other experiences, other demographics, other, like you need to push towards people's actual lived lives, which are intersectional. So I, I almost think like the challenge we have with, with gender in models is just, it's a red herring. The world's more complicated than that, right? That never helps you solve the problem to make the world more complicated. So your mileage may vary. Uh, I actually have a big daydream of getting people from non-engineering backgrounds into data science. So when data science started, it actually was a bunch of people with a bunch of different training backgrounds uh, moving into a, a newer field or a, a rebranded field, if you will. Uh, there wasn't any formal training for data science uh, and, but you would bring your quant skills, you'd bring your coding skills, and you'd, uh, you'd learn through experience. That actually creates a much more diverse set of data scientists than looking for pseudo engineers, right? So to the extent you're looking for pseudo engineers, you're going to replicate all of the flaws, all of the pipeline, talent pipeline characteristics that happen in engineering, right? Like I came from a family of teachers and engineers, but I wasn't told that I should be an engineer. And it didn't occur to me until I was in my late twenties that I could have been an engineer, right? Like that's the pipeline problem right there in a nutshell. Um, that's in the engineering talent pipeline from like sixth grade. So if you're, if, if that's how you're hiring people, you will, you will always hire the same people over and over again. You have to think outside of that talent pipeline. The, the most clever quant people I know were women who dragged their PhDs all the way to the quant edge of their field, even if their field was a softer social science. Those folks should be able to cross over really easily. They clearly can learn. And so a little bit of patience and some reasonable training should get those people right in, in place. And to the extent we don't do that is the extent that we will just keep the status quo going. And I think that's also true uh, for other 
demographics, right? So one of the things I'm doing at Starbucks, uh, so I have a first mover fellowship from the Aspen Institute to stand up a store to analytics talent pathway. If you look at organizations, retail organizations, the population in the stores is often much more diverse than the population in corporate America. And I have had friends work in stores while they work on their master's degrees. I know there are people who are working very hard to start their career and the stores are uh, where they are right now. So why can't we find those people? Why can't we bring them in, help them kind of make the cultural shift from stores to a corporate setting, give them, you know, a little more training with SQL, time with some Python and some real data, and then put them in a job. So that's, I'm just starting that program at Starbucks. Uh, We have our first partner. I have two more that I like hope to bring in. I'm finding them. They're like hiring managers and their projects. And the goal is to build a program around them that will scale and move more people into analytics and potentially into the SSC if there are other orgs that want to take part. It's just, uh, it seems silly to me that we don't do this already. So A, I'm pretty idealistic. I think people can learn these things. I learned these things. I can teach these things to other people. There's plenty of learning resources out there. We can pull something together that can get someone into a data analyst role in, you know, corporate Starbucks. I think we probably for a, like to create a real diverse pool of applicants need to go earlier than people who already have degrees. So I think that's actually like the second phase is like, did you take a stats class? Did you take a math class? Did you like it? How'd you do? Oh, cool. You know, there are jobs in that field. I have one of those jobs. Jane has one of those jobs. <laughs> like we can tell you about these jobs and we can inspire you to get further training and maybe, you know, a scholarship or a fellowship would go a long way in that area. And then you start to get to, all right, we will build our own pipeline. I hate the word pipeline. I'd call it a pathway. We'll build our own pathway. It'll be an alternate pathway or a series of alternate pathways, but we can get you there. We can effectively get you the same training those engineers got eventually. We can invest in you and, and help you grow. Like, and the, the talent landscape these days has shifted so much that this is actually uh, becoming a necessary thing for companies to do. We need so many more analysts than we have. And the, the until you are writing code against our data, you really don't understand our, our terrain. So why not? Why not? You'll be able to find them. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. We really appreciate it. It's been a lot Thanks. of fun. Yeah, it's this been was great. a lot of fun. Take care of each other.